it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 760 for February 28th. Nope, I wrote that yesterday for March 1st, 2023, and I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Rod Simmons, who is one third of the SMR podcast. Welcome back to the show, Rod. Thank you so much. It's nice to know that someone as polished as you can make mistakes, like on date, <laughs> like where you write. I usually will look at one thing and then like bounce around and I, I mess up date or the show number because I'm looking at the last show number and I just know to increment and I forget to increment. So <laughs> I've been talking a lot about back. that increment problem, but uh, this time I can blame text expander because I wrote the notes yesterday and I have a text expander snippet that writes the intro for me. So I wrote it yesterday, which is why it says yesterday's date. But hey, um, the reason I asked Rod to come on the show is that he, like many people became, and I'm going to be uh generous here and say that we're disenchanted with LastPass <laughs> after their progressive disclosure of security breaches. And he's migrated to 1Password. I wanted to hear about his migration because he, boy, he did it. He did it. He did the uh, migration and it, there's a lot to this. Um, I want to tell you guys up front, and uh, I didn't warn Rob that I'm going to say this, but he has an incredible ability to find the bugs and bad things in absolutely everything. Um, it's it's a talent. And so uh, he might not be uh, the cheerleader type that I am. I tend to see everything uh, half full. And he's kind of, maybe he'll begrudgingly give you 12% full, something like that on everything. So uh, is, is that a fair assessment, Rod? Yeah. I mean, to be fair, I work in, I work in product design. So I, certain oh. things, well, certain things tend to just pop to me because it's like, well, that's not how I would have built it. And which means it's not right. Uh, so, <laughs> of course not. And that's just, uh, I think that's probably just a flaw of the career field being in, but yeah, I, I, I feel like I, I, I like to say over time, I tend to push products to definitely the extremes of, uh, and I find, I find little bugs, but I'll say with one password, I don't feel like I've, I've only found one thing that didn't really work the way I intended it, but it was an edge case. So I wasn't worried, worried about it. It's so far. Oh, I don't want to bury the lead, but so far, good. <laughs> I'm liking the app so far. Okay. That, that's about as, as positive of a rating I've ever heard Rod give anything. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it, I don't want to get into details of your actual career, but you've got somewhat of a security background. Is that a, like- Yes, the, that is correct. The software that you work yeah, with? Yeah. So, I mean, I can tell a little bit of background. So I started my, you know, if I and can, don't want to go back too far- uh, most people will start guessing my age at that point. But if I went back 20 years of my career, I really focused on like, I was in the Windows space, Active Directory, onboarding, uh, mainly like migration, all that kind of stuff. And then it, my career slowly evolved more identity focused, oh. uh, like looking at threats, uh, persistent threats, detecting threats, mitigating threats. And then around, like now I'm really focused around governance, identity management, and all the security that has to do banking it around uh, identity and governance and reducing risk for organizations. So I'd probably say the last 10 to 15 years of my career have been really heavily focused on either threat detection, threat mitigation, and or um, understand, like really focused on identity uh, as it relates to users and enterprises. Okay. So, so kind of fun. not not at the uh, regular user home consumer level, but certainly attentive to things along the security lines, especially with password managers? Yeah, and honestly, I'd say if you look at the enterprise, it's, it's I feel it's fundamentally no different than the home user. It's mm. just it's 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 at scale. Like we all, as an end user, we deal with identity management. If you look at you as being the identity, and I have all these accounts, and I need to manage them across all these disparate systems, you're dealing with the same problem enterprises are dealing with, but they just deal with it for every single employee, every single account that they're provisioning to the user. So it's it's every problem that the enterprise has. It's just. They deal with it at Multiply. scale. You deal with it, yeah, on your own basis. Except if your company isn't real smart. Um, I remember I worked for a company that uh, I did a, a series of tutorial things, of video tutorials, not unlike what I do for Screencast Online, except I had to do it on Windows on Camtasia. And it was the worst piece of software I've ever used in my entire life. But anyway, I did these tutorial <laughs> videos and I and I learned about LastPass. And so I did a video tutorial on LastPass and explained how it worked and how now we can store our passwords in the secure vault and all this stuff. And within 
10 minutes of me posting it, security took it down and banned LastPass from our, from our uh, uh, oh, wow. domain because they didn't trust that, uh, it, well, there, there was this free version. And if there's a free version, that must mean they're selling all your data. And so we can't possibly have that. So there were no password managers. Now, I did retire a decade ago. I don't know what the situation is now, but a decade ago, there was a way to have your password secure and they didn't let us. So. So I'm sure Bart has probably told you about this many times, but I will share along. If uh, anybody's interested, I think this is a really cool thing. If you want to know what's happening in the enterprise, Okta, O-K-T-A, they do a really cool report every year. I'm going to drop a, a, a URL in the chat. They do it every year. It's a, This is a 2022 report, but it's called Business at Work. The really cool thing is you see what, what applications businesses are using in this report. and By um, business or... I, um, it doesn't really break it out by what businesses. It just says like, okay, these are the most popular apps and enterprises. It, it gives you like, and if you if you scroll through the report, you'll quickly start to see like, okay, you start off very broad level looking at it by category. They call out some specific apps. LastPass was one of the growing apps from 2021 as they did the report in 2022, which, oh my gosh, <laughs> hindsight would have been 2020 here. Um, but I, as you start to scroll through, you'll if you just search for one password, you'll see one password. Um, is actually on their chart of one of their top growing applications. Mm. I think it grew at like 198%. Was that um, before and after the, enterprise. the breach? That was 2021 LastPass. going into 2022. Oh, so at the same time, <laughs> LastPass was growing. One password where they were both on a very good upward trajectory, while LastPass was probably more dominant. So I'm I'm really interested to see the report in 2022 or the, the report that covers 2022 that we get 2023 mm -hmm. and the 2023 and 2024 <laughs> as to does LastPass just totally fall off the enterprise uh, password solution uh, market because I I would imagine the report that will report the end of this year will see a change but it's a really again it's a really cool report if you're just trying to figure out like what applications do enterprises use um, you'll see like uh, what's most important like Netscape and uh, Postman and Intercom but one one password is down there it's seconds from the bottom on the fastest growing apps with unique visitors did you just one put Netscape in that list. Uh, it's not, not oh, sorry Netscope I said scope I, sorry <laughs> no, I did say scape <laughs> yeah well, I apologize really keep, this was from 1957 right? <laughs> now you do have to create a login in order to see this report it looks like no the URL I gave you should have been free if not I will I'll send you it's, this should be a I sent you just the link right to the if you google search for the name oh, of the report oh that's weird no you're right it is I, I, I don't know why I yeah, asked you should be able to get it. yeah yeah, you should be able to get right to the report at, at no cost. It's a again, it's a fantastic report that they put out. It tells you a lot of information about because if you think about what, sorry, if you don't know what Octa, if at the heart Octa is like an IDP identity provider, and all they're really trying to accomplish is you don't want to use Microsoft for authentication, use Octa, but they can understand what apps, what applications your users are authenticating to. So you take your token, you go and you want to log into one password. They know that that's a unique new user going to one password. So they can say of our user base, which is massive, not as big as like Microsoft's Azure uh, Active Directory authentication platform, but it's huge. Okay. And for them to be able to provide this data and you can see growth, you can see trends in the marketplace. So it's a, it's a fantastic report if you've never never seen it. And again, it looks like it's about a million about pages it. long, but if you like <laughs> my scroll yeah. bar is the smallest scroll bar I've ever seen, but yeah, this it's, it's long, but you can zoom to the, um, to the graphics and stuff. Yeah. Pretty I think cool. of it as the Verizon data breach report. There are very few people who read it in entirety, but everybody like looks through and says, what is this graph? What is it saying? Okay. Next graph. Um, <laughs> this is a great report. If you're just trying to get statistics or if you work somewhat in this field and you're trying to sort of verify like, Hey, what are the popular apps? What should we be looking at? And you're trying to figure out uh, what other companies are using. This is a great way to get some uh, dynamic data. So yeah. there you go. Interesting. Okay. All right. Back to the topic. So just to get people up to date on uh, what LastPass did wrong and why was it so egregious for you to abandon the product? And by the way, uh, there was a new report out from LastPass today with their final findings. So uh, why, why don't you just refresh people? What did, what did LastPass do? What was, what was so bad that would make you leave? Yeah, so I'll start with, I was, I was a LastPass user and I, I feel like it's been like 13 years, 13, 14 years. It's been a long time I've been with LastPass. That's hard to, hard so, to break up with somebody you've been with that yeah, long. That's, yeah, that's a good relationship right there. Uh, and I want to start, the, the fact that they were breached is the, literally the least of my concern. And it sounds really odd because most people, like, I, mind you, if 
when it bet 10 years, I would ask people, how many people have been abroad in a data breach? You'd have one hand raised in a room. Um, and then as each year, that number would multiply. It was like a, it was like this exponential curve of how many people in a room. So everyone has had their data lost in a breach. And that's not the bad part. The bad part is how does the organization handle it and report it? So I, for me, LastPass lost my trust. And th that's right there. I just, I couldn't keep my credentials with them. Not because like, I feel maybe they didn't, they don't have the greatest security controls in place for enterprise management. Uh, that's yeah. I, I don't want to overstate it because again, I don't know their internal process, but it feels that way a little bit of comes of what happened. So I'll give you a great example. Someone was able to compromise credentials on a laptop. Totally fine. They were able to exfiltrate out data, but there was nothing in that said, hey, this is abnormal data for Rod to be downloading all of this stuff. Like, even though I'm an authorized user and I should have access to it, isn't it abnormal that I'm doing this? Like, it didn't pick up on any anomalies of my behavior. But for me, the biggest part was if they would have said, like, day one, as soon as they learned, we've been breached, we don't know the full scope of what we've lost, but we do feel that there was some data loss. It may have been vaults. If you want to take as much corrective action as possible, we'd recommend changing passwords. And that would have been I what, would like last May or March or something like that? It was pretty early last yeah. year. Yeah, I thought it was, wasn't until August. It was, was in August the I think second it was August. One? Yeah, oh, maybe it was the second one. Uh, August, I know August through October was kind of a big one. Because there, there were two incidents. Yes, I thought it was August through October. Maybe there was another one right before it. But again, for me, it's disclosure. Tell me as fast Timely. as you can so I can right. I can make a quick decision. And for me, again, I don't like changing 400 passwords. But if that's what I have to do, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And for how I use my vault, I, I've definitely changed how I'm using 1Password compared to LastPass. And I'll talk to that a little bit as we kind of get into 1Password. Um, but the type of data I was storing in my vault, I started realizing like, oh my gosh, if someone actually could decrypt my vault. So I'll give a good example. I've always said, I don't, when I go to a site and it says, okay, well, you have to set up how you get back in if you forgot your password. Um, I would say, all right, it doesn't matter what question. I'll just choose a random question. I would copy what the question was and put it in a note on my vault. And then I would just generate a random password and put it as the answer. Right. So my do. answers were never valid. Right. The problem is they were in my vault. <laughs> so right. now if you compromise my vault, you had my username, my password, and all my question answers. That's and I was like, uh, yeah, but and but that's what and MFA that's backup the one keys. source you are supposed to uh, supposed to trust. Trust, I know. And if Lo and behold, I, but I think that's one of the that was one of the problems with the uh, LastPass breach was that we found out that certain things were not encrypted, mm -hmm. and we yeah. do know with one password that those same things all encrypted. are all encrypted. Um, yeah. One of, one of the things that gave me the most angst was, and I always get the acronym wrong. It starts with PD something K F two. It's yeah, got a lot of letters. Of the rounds of encryption. They yeah. Do. The rounds of encryption. So from uh, the, the current recommendation is 600,000 rounds of encryption uh, passes. So they go through your password and they hash it and hash it, and hash it over and over and over again. They, they were not doing 600,000. They were doing 200,000, but only on like recent vaults. And if you had an older vault, yeah. It w we kept hearing progressive disclosure of how few passes there were, and I had a test account that I had no live data in, and mine was at five thousand, which is basically yeah. you know somebody when with, it first started with with the with the smallest um, uh, Raspberry Pi could crack that in about ten minutes, right? <laughs> So, I mean, I'm exaggerating, maybe. You're probably not, actually. <laughs> not by that much, right? And so they did up people, but they didn't do it retroactively. Like, new accounts got it. And and when you talk about the security controls that they had, that's a, a, a real perfect example of where they didn't have the security controls in place to protect the data, right? Yeah, so, um, all right. So my vault at one time was 5,000. Uh, and that was, again, 13 years ago. And then I remember an episode of Security Now where Steve Gibson made a comment and said, oh, you should up it. You can go. I think it was when they let you go up to like 20,000 or 25,000. And he's like, you should just choose a number randomly because you don't want to give away exactly how many you're using. You want to be somewhere in that general range. I was like, that's probably a valid statement. So I increased mine. And I've subsequently over the years just always increased their number of rounds I never even knew it was a setting. I mean, yeah, most people did. I would know. 
yeah, what no works is watch the security now. <laughs> yeah, what we so, did, we didn't learn much in the uh, briefing that came out today from LastPass, but what I did learn that I didn't know before, maybe everybody else knew, is that one of the things they lost unencrypted was how many uh, passes you had, how many iterations your vault had. So yeah, they can now not, sort that by, okay, here's all our 5,000s and let's just scrape those right now. They also gave away how many, like the other thing that was lost, and this is, that's another thing that really pissed me off. Like the rounds of encryption, I, 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 damn, I know I hated that, but they do have to store that, that they stored last time you visited a site. So to me, what that, oh. what that kind of leads on to an attacker is what do I actively use? So it also, it gives you two good ways of looking at attacking a user, identify people with the highest, the lowest rounds of encryption, and then go after the, like, you could either go after the sites that look enticing because you know the URLs. Mm -hmm. So you know, I have an account there and go after things I don't frequently use and work your way up the stack or go after the things you know that I actively use because you know, the credentials are valid. You can look at it either way, either way, it's bad. Right. And or the the, yeah. uh, the cross section of the two, uh, we did also learn. You're going to be talking about this with um, one password in the transition. But the what is it called? Equivalent URLs, like where Google.com and Gmail.com and uh, are are the same. <laughs> um, yep. They they lost that list that you had self created. Not only did they, of course, the list that they uh, offered you already that these things are all the same, like Audible's the same as Amazon. Um, yep. that, that was public knowledge, but they lost whatever ones you set up as well. Yeah. So equivalent domains, I, I'm, so I'm not too concerned with losing equivalent domains. Cause I, I think that's, uh, but additionally, it, it's, it's the additive yeah, yeah. nature yeah, of these yeah, things. Yeah. I know right? it's a death by a thousand cuts. Uh, you just like rubbing salt in that wound, don't you? Uh, yeah, I don't like that. They lost the data again. I, I will always come back to my bigger issue with them was, um, this the speed at which they disclose it disclose data to us and that that just killed but equivalent domains it's it's one thing that i deeply miss uh <laughs> well, let's get I, into I that one second because i want to say had that one more thing that bothered me about the last pass breach was that they still haven't even in the new report because i read the whole darn thing today um they don't tell us what the date of those backups that they lost were were so if they lost backups from uh you know a month before the breach yeah and you had, you know, 200,000 on your, on your iterations, you know, you're probably okay. But if they lost them from five years ago or 10 years ago, or all of them 13 yeah. years ago, then you're, then they have an encrypted version of your vault at 5,000 uh, iterations, even though you have diligently gone in and changed it. So they still haven't told us when those backups were. Yeah. And I think probably if I had to guess on part of the challenge is maybe a lot of, oh no, even if you. It depends on how they're backing up the vaults because there may be certain data that's quote not vault data. So if a lot of some people might put credentials in, they virtually never change. So to say, uh, yeah, there could be challenges of some. how they're trying to articulate what uh, the date really is. Because one might, person might want to say, "What date is my vault?" Like, yeah, yeah, um, that is the versus question. what. But saying, "Look, we lost backups for everyone's vault as of this date," I think would have been uh, helpful. The most accurate thing to. It would have just, it gives you a general idea, but I, if I'm, I'm trying to remember the last pass UI, I can't, I don't think there's a way I can see the last time I changed the password and I, you know, I can see the last time I changed a password, but it's, it's not really, it's, you have to look at every single item. There's no way you can see like last updated password changed, okay. like in a very clean, if I remember correctly, in a very clean way to see that. Cause then at that point, if you know, you lost it on August 1st, but you've changed a bunch since August 1st, you'd say, well, these are safe. So I just need to start changing the other ones. But yeah. I think for most people, most of their passwords are aged uh, a little further than they should be. Yeah. Um, I think one password, I seem to remember one of the things Watchtower gives you is um, something you haven't updated in a really long time. Yes. One last um, pass, you could do the same thing. The challenge, I think, with um, when you're talking password eight, it's you really just needed a, it was changed on this date and I need to sort by last date change on the password so I could go and attack uh, the ones that potentially would have been known by the attackers because of the bundle that they have. Uh, and I don't think anybody really provides that, but there's not really a good use case to provide that. What you would LastPass, one password, and all the vendors typically would say, 
you haven't changed this password in like 234 days. So get to work. Yeah. So it's telling you that they're just really old. Like get get on these items. Right. The but, chances that yeah. you had a good password that long ago are fairly low. It's and and by the way, these things aren't telling you change it every 30 days or any of that nonsense. We already know that's a bad idea. All right, let's yeah. let's shift gears. Bottom line. Yep. They lost your trust because they Scrooge, didn't disclose yeah. properly uh, the right information at the right time. So they're so they're yes. dead to you. Now, how did you decide uh, to go to go with one password? Did you do a big old matrix of all the different possible uh, 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 password managers out there with feature lists or? So no, I listened to I listened to two close friends. You, I know you're a huge one password user, so that was already one top of the list for me to take a look and consider because you gave glowing recommendations for it. And I've heard you talk about all the security with it. So that puts it on the list, at least of things to look at. And then Bitwarden was, I had a bunch of friends, security guys who were using Bitwarden, swore by it and said, it's a great password manager. You should at least give it a look. So that put those two on the top of the list. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're thinking, what about Dashlane? Because Dashlane has some really cool features, but I had a friend who had credentials in Dashlane and then they went to this kind of fun paid model. And his... Uh, as he describes it, my password got held hostage until I paid the fee um, oh. because he was, I, I'm assuming he was in between where they went from free to paid tier at the, okay. either the number of credentials or time range. And then he couldn't get access to anything where it was free at one time and then it went to paid. So he felt it. they held him ransom. So for me, they were off my list because because of the bad experience I heard a friend went through. So for me, it was two password managers, uh, Bitwarden and uh, one password. Okay. All right. So um, you took a look at the two. Uh, how did you decide one password over Bitwarden? Just Bitwarden annoyed the love of me. Oh. Um, and <laughs> watch your tongue. There's yeah. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> there's there's a um, there's there's a lack of polish. So there are little things in Bitwarden that, like I say, would drive me crazy. So a, a good one good example. And I again reaching out to the friend saying, okay, you're using this. I've imported all my LastPass credentials. Great. Now what I'm trying to do is I have a credential and all I want to do is click on the three dots and move this credential like into a folder, tag it, some, like some type of concept. Mm -hmm. And they have a concept called tagging, but you can't add a tag to a credential unless you click on the credential and then you can add your tags to it, like by going into or folderizing it. You had to go into the credential to add it to a folder. But for me, I only had like four or five like category folders as I was scaling them up because uh -huh. I was reorganizing my credentials as I wanted them. But I'm like, why do I have to go into the credential to find something to then add this in here? So, so that's just like, UI it was clumsiness. Little user, yeah, little UI clumsiness. And the funny thing was, I was like, all right, maybe I'm doing something wrong. So the first thing I tend to do is, I don't assume that I know everything right. I go and start looking at the forms. And many of the items that like I kept stumbling over with Bitwarden, a lot of people were complaining, complaining about in the forms. And the form threads would start like 2015 and okay. still oh, be complaining about it in 2022. Okay. So it tells me that it's not that I don't, I don't want to imply that they're not doing active development. They really are. Because um, they have some better, like, like the OTPs um, that both 1Password or yeah, one password. OTP Bitwarden is have. one time LastPass, password, by the way. Sorry, yeah. That's okay. One last pass didn't have that, or at least I never looked for it. Um, so it, to me, those are great features. They're uh, well to an extent. I'll explain why I don't love them a lot, but that's a different story. But they're great features that they're adding on. It just feels like they're not getting at the little nickels that bother yeah. people. Like, yeah, there's the, just, just sharp usability. corners. And you know, I wanted no. something for the family, so it had to be better than what my wife was using. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just not. It's from a well, what was general she using before? end user. She's using one password. Oh, okay. So she's so, already one password user. She's an already one password okay, user. Good. So I, if I was going to give her something new, it literally had to be a net increase in the quality of her experience versus a decrease. And I I deeply feel after using one password, it is a far better end user experience. So my wife won't complain. My kids won't complain. <laughs> and I, I can use anything. But so I, I only want to pay for this that. thing one time. So yeah. it, it, it's um, not to be too much of a cheerleader for 1Password, but it's in my personality. When when 1Password went from seven to eight, there was a lot of hue and cry and annoyance about it. Uh, the, the main thing you was- You fixed Microsoft. What's that? 
you fixed my wife's problems, remember? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Well, but they, they uh, the biggest thing was that they became an Electron app so that it worked well across all platforms. And I, I can't blame them for wanting to do that. And they did a really, really, really good job of a... Um, of an Electron platform, it, it, of Electron implementation, I should say. I think they did a good job. It's fast, and uh, but they had a bunch of problems with uh, usability, and people just screamed at them, and they just came out with an update where they went, okay, we heard you. You said this stunk, this stunk, this stunk. You hated this. You didn't like this. You didn't like this. You didn't like this. Yeah, we just fixed it. And so unlike uh, uh, Bitwarden, where this, the complaints are heard but not addressed, I think, I'm, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm sure there's complaints people are going to have to me about what they don't like still, but they are reactive to, to that. And I think that's great. So I don't, I guess I don't have the historical bad, like, let me explain the problem I ran into, because this will also explain why Allison was like, you were wrong on how to migrate. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, he was talking on SMR podcast and I was screaming into my phone, just going, no, <laughs> this is all wrong. So I think it was from six to seven. My, I think I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah. Six to seven. My my, oh, one password at some, at, my wife somehow ended up with two vaults. So, but the, unfortunately I wasn't a, one password user. So to me, it, nothing made sense. It was just like, sometimes she, like she would be in the browser and when she'd log in, she'd see some credentials, but on the desktop app, she wouldn't see the same things. So she's in this very weird world, mm -hmm. but it wasn't literally making, I was like, I don't understand why. And when it was like, Allison's coming to town, I was like, thank God, a one password <laughs> user can figure this thing out. Cause it, it didn't make sense. I was like, I don't know why something's in the desktop and not here. And I just couldn't figure, I just, I yeah. didn't want to dig into it, but I also was like, I don't know which one's right, which one's wrong. And Allison was able to figure out for somehow her browser was stuck in one version with one in one in vault one or vault. and another the the desktop app was in another version with a different vault, but each vault had the same credentials. But every yeah, time there she were would some add something duplicates and everything going yeah. on. So, so it was um, like just Okay. Yeah, so one of the things that is a big difference between LastPass and 1Password in LastPass, um, if I want to share, if I wanted to share a password with Steve, I could take the password and say, I'm going to share this with Steve. And then Steve and I, and we could share it so that we would both be able to change it. But you do it on, a, right. on an individual um, login or credential uh, element individually. In 1Password, you create these vaults, and it's just you have a shared vault. So, or you have a work vault and a home vault, and you can easily yes. right now with 1Password 8, and it might have been in 7, uh, in the later versions of 7, but you can just drag and drop things into these different vaults. So if you're looking at one vault, you'd be going, where'd all my credentials go? I don't know where they are, and they're actually in the other vault. So the whole concept of a vault would have been something you had never seen before, having been a LastPass user. Yes. And I like the sharing in the family. I think it challenges across to friends like if i want to share a credential i think the max i can share it with you for is 30 days mm. and i like okay. i can't share something with you through perpetuity oh, and i, I wish that there that. was an option that i could share long term so a good example is when you're quote blogging with somebody or you're doing a podcast or you have like a shared account to log into your web host and it's just one account everybody just, anybody who needs it can get to that one account because you can't provision any other account with this particular level of access so all the people who need it, but we don't want to be on a family plan. Yeah. So that it's the one oh, limitation I feel with sharing. It, again, it, it's a minor, but it's, I don't want to say it's an edge use case, but what I do like about the family sharing, and I haven't tried it, but I'm sure this works, is that if you put the MFA on top of it for credentials that at one point in time, you're like, well, I'm sharing this with somebody, but I have my phone with the app and they can't log in. Now I can share a credential with them. It has the MFA code across my family. And everyone has it. So I don't have to weaken security for a site because I want to use MFA. You just roll the MFA inside of last or one password and it's on the essential, the record in the vault. That makes yeah. Sense. yeah. So let me, let me use some more words around this. So people know what Rod's talking about. <laughs> um, you're deep into it. So, and, and most of our listeners are into, into this stuff, but just in case, uh, when he says MFA means multi-factor authentication, and he's talking about how you can add a one-time password 
to an, uh, an entry, one of your things in your vault. And so I never knew this was there until I watched a screencast online video that Don McAllister did about 1Password. I did, it's, it's so weirdly buried when you open up, instead of being an obvious thing of two-factor authentication, which I think it should be surfaced like right at the top, I think it should be there. You have to go into add more, one-time password, and then there's a little icon that looks like a miniature QR code and you tap on that and then you can, you can, it'll recognize if there's a QR code on the screen for the site you're trying to log into. Um, and, and it actually changed how it worked in different versions of it. You can also type in the one-time passcode. But I, I personally think that that from a, let's complain about product design. Why is that not near the top of things that you would know where it was even there? I, mean, I think it should be when you're looking at a record, you click edit, it should be right there on the screen. The way I stumbled across it was looking in Watchtower and Watchtower. Explain what Watchtower say, is. Oh, oh, sorry. Watchtower is equivalent to, well, I should well, just let me stop talk it? about one password. It, it essentially analyzes your vault to find all the things that you should fix to have a better security hygiene. So for example, password reuse, it'll tell you that, Hey, you have password reuse every vault. I think does one thing wrong when it comes to password you use is doesn't say, Hey, this, these three are the same. So you know what, like how you're, how you're quote duplicated or triplicated or quadruple or whatever you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. So it will tell you the password reuse. It will tell you, I think weak passwords inside the vault. I don't well, have any. One password does show you which ones are the same. Oh, I don't have any that are the same anymore. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, it uh, will show you. I mean, it will so say it that says, this I have one, one for California pizza kitchen. I have one for CPK. California Pizza Kitchen, because one oh. is the ordering site and one is the menu. So they oh, are the same. So they're equivalent domains, right? <laughs> they are. Yeah. And and let, let's jump to equivalent domains. So this is a, a phrase <laughs> I'd never heard before because it was something, it was a feature named that in, in LastPass. But from what I understand, this is where you have two different things, let's say CPK and its, and its ordering system, which is like Snapfish or something, I forget what it is, it's something else. Those two things are the same place. Therefore, I have the same password. It never occurred to me until somebody mentioned it to me just like six months ago. Well, just put both domains into the same entry and then you don't have to have separate entries. And then it won't be, it won't look like an error. 100% an absolute true statement. However. It did, didn't occur to me. It is Snapfinger, I guessed right. Yeah, it, it does require you to update the vault Okay. versus the vault just because some over time what winds up happening is that you've you've saved things over the years and like for example today um well, oh, oh let's actually let's go back in the day at one point in time you had a sprint account well sprint was sprint mm -hmm. and then you decided i hate sprint i'm going to nextel so you or vice versa and now you have a nextel account and then sprint acquires nextel i have to tell you that association so i may have never went and got rid of my quote sprint one that was sitting in my vault i didn't do the hygiene and clean up and i now have this next cell thing but they got acquired and it's really the same thing so now the system in the back end could just say look these are equivalent domains don't worry about the records anymore it's okay so the equivalent domains takes care of things that a i don't like sometimes the user doesn't know like you know that apple is the same thing as icloud they're absolute equivalents but the, most users don't know all the various equivalents so if you get into like you have bing Hotmail, Live, Microsoft, MSN, like Xbox, Azure, they're all the same. And I'm giving you very obvious ones, but you start to get into like very obscure ones. Like actually, you know, Amazon.com, Amazon.com.be, dot .ae, mm -hmm. and then the list. And you just you're just always gonna cascade down this rabbit hill of these all these equivalent domains that you just may not know what to do. Um, and you don't know that they're quote equivalents until you stumble across them. And it's nice to have that categorized list. Someone has actually done the work for you. And I think it's something you can also crowdsource and share. So um, you, you went on uh, what I'm going to call a venomous rant about the fact that 1Password didn't have this feature. And it would have never clear. occurred to me that this was something that would be helpful. It is tremendously helpful because here's the thing. When you have equivalent domains, if I go to... If I'm at Microsoft.com, mean predefined, and, yeah, and by that you mean predefined. Someone else has done the work to tell you that Skype and Microsoft 365 login are the same. Yep. So when I go to uh, like Xbox.com, and I already have a Microsoft account, it just says, "Yeah, you want to log in with the Microsoft account." I, so I never actually make the mistake of 
quote, doing the create or doing this and then saving it because of them being equivalent. Like I, there's no work on my part because it just says I'll pop the credential because they are equivalent domains. And again, if you look at someone like one password, you, you, they're trusted to kind of do some of the management of this stuff. And most of the lists that, that many of these vendors come up with, they're, I don't want to say they're the obvious ones, but LastPass was a very extensive for the number of equivalents they had. Like there are some that I'm like, I never use it, but if I stumble, uh, I'm okay. I know I'm covered. Yeah, but and, how, just because they have hundreds of those, how many do you actually need? I don't know. And it didn't matter. I never had to think about it. Yeah, that, but, that was the beauty. But it's is, maybe it's, 10 or 15. This is, uh, the, it just seems, it just seemed like a huge deal to you that this was, uh, like the so, end of times as we know it, because they did because one password didn't have this, and I thought like, no, it, hey, that's kind of a cool feature. It grows over time, and you again, it's one of those things. It's almost like you don't know how great something is until someone just takes it away. You're like, man, this was really nice. Like I didn't realize I used it, and for me, it was a lot of sites like Marriott Properties. I had to deal with this with Microsoft. I had to deal with this. U, uh, Unify, which at one point in time I never had, but Unify has two sites, UBNT and UI.com. And again, like I say, the list just kept going on and on and on and on and on. And it was many of the vendors, by by the nature of 1Password doing this for me, it prevented me from accidentally creating these other credentials and then getting myself out of sync of what the heck's going on, why aren't things working? The equivalent domain global setting save the user from trying to figure like it, essentially you're putting it on top of the user to figure out what are global domains or equivalent okay. domains. So well, I, but I, again, I will, I will there's give a solution. you that, that that would have been cool. I mean, I, my, my favorite, <laughs> um, if I could complain about one pass about, about one thing is in general, when you do a search, it searches the names. I think there is a way to search farther in, but I have a login called Microsoft OneDrive Skype Office Live. Actually, I need to add 365 in there <laughs> so that I can find it because whatever I'm sure I can search for Skype and I can't find my Skype account because it's under Microsoft. So I had to put everything into the title so that it could find that this is all the same <laughs> dang thing. Just put the extra URLs in. You're good to go. You never have to think. No, uh, no, no. no I, they I are, but, saying, but I'm saying when I'm searching it for on, it. When I'm searching yeah, you're thinking for it. Because you're on 365 or well, you're I'm on this. I'm in the Skype app. That's where app. your brain is. Yeah. I'm in the Skype app. That's not an equivalent domain at all. It is. Yeah. I use no, my, the Skype app is I, not no, a no, domain. Skype, no, I don't use it. That's not equivalent domain. No, I don't use when I use a Skype credential to get into Skype. That is correct. Well, but I mean, that, it's an app. It's not a domain. So yeah, the but, equivalent I mean, domain on, wouldn't help me. Well, on the, is on the iPhone, doesn't it work? I thought on the iPhone, like if you, I know with 1Password you could, or LastPass you could. Yeah, one, I've done it with 1Password where you go and you launch an app and then it's, it, when the username password it feels, sure, it will sure, search. but there's not a it's domain. It's always been accurate for, for me. Yeah, but it's not a there. It is an HTTPS colon slash slash something. Yeah, but I'm assuming there's got to be a way it figures out because like if I like yeah, earlier right, today, right. I, somehow it knew like I when I logged into like my HR benefit site, it says here's the one. It's like yep, that's it. Click. So somehow it's pulling something. So I'm assuming that the apps are sending a rel a domain to these. I, I don't know. There's got to be something they're doing to figure it out, but. I know that 99% of the time, there's very few apps I, I deal with that don't work. Okay. So let's talk about the process you followed, because um, mm. I do know people who have abandoned LastPass, and uh, the people I'm most proud of, my my daughter, Lindsay, and her husband, Nolan, um, I was so bummed about the LastPass breach because we had just convinced him to use a uh, password <laughs> manager after years and years and years and years of badgering him. And uh, and so having to write to him and tell him, yeah, so uh, you're kind of on the wrong one. Uh, but he confessed to me that he really liked having a password manager. It made him really happy. And so they just went, okay, we're out. What should we do? And and I had a family plan where I was able to add Lindsay without any extra cost. And I think Nolan cost me like $2 a month. I said, I will pay for this because I feel so bad. I'll add the $2 to my account. And they just like did it. I mean, they didn't, they didn't call me. They didn't ask for any help. They just did it. And then they went in and they said, okay, all our banking stuff and all of our, uh, you know, insurance, everything, we'll change all those passwords. They went in and did all the important stuff. But you didn't just do the important stuff. You literally changed 400 passwords. Is that right? God, it was awful. Yes. <laughs> so what I was your process? How did you do it? All right. So I'll start with, there's one feature in last and one password that made this 10 times easier for me. Uh, I shouldn't say 10 times, but it made organization of it easier. I, so 
Chris, another guy in SMR, what he did was he was he would create them in um in one password and then delete them. So change create them, change them, and then delete. I was like, I'm not doing that. I created a new vault called LastPass and put all my credentials in there. Okay. And then as I would go through and change them, I would move them to the private vault oh. with the one that is just mine. And oh, it, it essentially gave me a to-do list. It's, 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 yeah. Everybody likes to-do list. So it was just a to-do list. Go through and change all these. So I could change the credentials. I could add MFA. So, And that's what I found is like, if I was in there and it didn't have MFA configured, I was configuring MFA. I was changing passwords. I was making sure I had backup codes. I was changing security questions. And then on to the next one. So that that that's organization a really alone, good way to do it. It was it, it for me. It was a game changer because it made it ten thousand times easier. Not to which one did I change? And yeah. again, I wanted to work off of a. I didn't want to start from A and go through Z. Um, like I either first credential on the list and then go through the last. You wanted to start with there, B for bank. <laughs> yeah, important, important, important. So, oddly enough, while banks, the first day I changed. Everything that had direct access to money, credit cards, oddly enough, and if you don't like, or like, um, if you're a Starbucks person, like Starbucks, as you might as well call it, it is a bank. They just don't never, they never give you back your money. Um, <laughs> but like things like that, yeah. I started changing all those credentials. Like, did you change your one. email password? The right on the same day, emails all went away. So I, I, so the nice thing about having everything out in a CSV file out of, uh, out of LastPass was I was able to sort by usernames and identify the most predominantly used email addresses. Okay. No, I don't say 100% of the time, but 99% of the time, your login for most sites is your email address. Right. So what I wanted to make sure is that I was, you know, you get your emails. Because sometimes you forget like, oh, I forgot I had that email address. So by organizing it, I was able to kind of go through and make sure like, okay, Gmail's first, then this, and then that. And it reminded me that, okay, but I don't know. I'm talking about anymore. actually changing the password to your email. Oh, that was, yeah, yeah, that was day one. So day one was all the email addresses. And because again, sometimes you have an email account that you're like, I totally forgot I created that mm -hmm. um, years ago and I don't really use it, but I was like, all right, well, if I'm changing, I'll change that as well. So I did all my email accounts, all the direct financial stuff was accomplished on day one. Let me, and then let me I interrupt going, for a second and, and explain. Uh, Bart has said it, I've said it, but I'm just going to say it every time the subject comes up. The single most important thing to change is the password on your email. And that sounds counterintuitive. You would think it would be your mm -hmm. bank or your iCloud password, but it's it, well, if your iCloud password is your email password, definitely it is the number one. But it's the number one because that's how you get password resets. So if someone has access to your password, to your email, then they own you. They own everything. They're, yep. You're game over, man. I mean, you know, I mean, there's MFA and stuff that could protect you, but change that first. Change your email password, and then yep. work. Then start working your way down to where you use that email password, right? Yeah. And again, if you're as long as you're changing the password, if you don't have MFA, multi-factor authentication, super easy to configure at that moment in time, and because of my model of my security questions were stored on each one of the records, I updated all my security questions and all the answers for every security question as I wow. went through those. Now, did you move um, those to, to a different service? Yeah, I, I, I store my, well, I'm not going to tell everybody, but yes, I have them in another encrypted area that my security okay. questions and MFA backup codes are stored on individual records that match the names of my sites in a different uh, secure storage. So wow, that's, I didn't that's wanna, messy. It is, but it, it allowed me to make sure that if for some reason something happens with one password where I lose it, I, I'm hoping that I won't lose all the question answer because that it took me a lot longer because I had to go through and like sometimes it's hard to find where you do question answer changes on sites and some sites mm. don't have the question answer change. So you, you're looking for something that actually doesn't exist. Um, yeah, that's tedious. But uh, it, it took me a little longer. So I was like, I don't want to go through this pain again. And I also don't want to go through having to disable MFA, re-enable MFA, get new codes. Um, hopefully, that I should be a little cleaner. Did you? So, are you using? Are you trusting one password for the uh, one-time passcode with the the QR code mm. and all that? Are you doing that, or are so, you keeping it in a third-party authentic? So this is both. So, this is my little oh, I thing that I both. I like and I don't like about uh, one password. So, I was really scratching my head because like. I, Watchtower kept saying, you have all these sites without MFA. And I'm like, I'm looking at this. I'm like, my Microsoft account has MFA on it. Like, I know I'm looking at the MFA oh, code but one password right doesn't know about it. Right. And 
what so what all they support is to say ignore this and i yeah, wish they need to no ignore option. this button all over the place yeah i i just wanted to say I, I don't it's not really ignore it's just it's managed elsewhere like i'd like to say already managed so it's not i feel it's a well, different or signal i can't than do ignore. anything about this is the button i want like like so, i've got my library card in there and the password to my library card is four digits. Stop yelling at me, Watchtower. I can't fix that. I can't change it. Yeah. I want to so, leave me alone. Quit bothering me. Looper's but. the hardest one to get the MFA taken oh. care of because you can't do... So the beautiful thing of how 1Password does MFA is a screen grab. So I mm -hmm. essentially was going to sites. And when I And I did set up... I set up on a lot of sites. I'd go to the site. I'd say set up MFA. The code would appear. I would just click scan. It's like, boom, it's in. I'm like, done. I copy the code, paste it in, and the login, oh my goodness. Like when you go to a site that requires MFA and you click login, it's just like, boom. This is like magic. <laughs> so it, it is Well, and you can tell which there. sites are good. My favorite is GitHub. So um, command uh, backslash, is that right? The one under the delete key. I always get mixed up which one's which. Uh, sorry. Like the one in the key. upper yeah, right. Backslash. There, yeah, backslash. That's backslash. Yeah. So command backslash. Um, I've got a t-shirt that says command backslash is my password. It's from one passwords. It's adorable. <laughs> anyway, you hit command backslash on a site like GitHub and it goes bleep, bleep. And then the second, the second page comes up with the MFA and it goes bleep and it logs you in. I mean, same it's thing instant. happens with my Synology. It's like bleep, 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 bleep. And you're in, you don't, there's, you don't have to hit enter. You hit nothing. Yes. It just does it. I love that one feature. When what it I, works. <laughs> the well, sites I that don't do it right. Yet. No, no, no. But so many sites like Google for crying out loud, let's, let's just operate everything onto separate pages and mislabel the button so that it doesn't work. So what it also does well is like with a site like Google, is it when on, if you're on the first page, like some sites will say, what's your email address? And you click on one password, it says it plays it in. And then when it advances to the next page, it just always puts in the right password. Yeah. And what I mean by the right one is if you had like five Google accounts, yeah, yeah. if it auto fills with one pass with with LastPass, it was like, man, it's a crap shoot. Which one I put in here? Like it might be the <laughs> oh, right it one. Will fill it'll it, be the but wrong it won't one. tell you which one. <laughs> you don't know which one to put in. So you're just like hoping. I've literally not had a single problem with with um, one password okay. actually putting in the correct password when we go to that's the next step. A, that's a great point. I shouldn't take that for granted. Yesterday, I was pulling some tax documents from to uh, an institution where Steve and I both have logins. And when yeah. I when I when it asked for the the login, it showed me mine and it showed me Steve's. When I chose mine, it auto filled my password on the next screen. When I put in his, it automatically put his password in the next screen. Yeah. So you it don't was realize those do fe nice features. That to me, bar a really beautiful feature on how they implemented that. I don't know if it's just pure luck for me. But you're describing the same behavior. But I know that I often had problems with that with LastPass. Often would go and click enter, and it's like oh, wrong password, and I have to hit the drop down, copy the particular password I wanted, and then paste it in. Um, so, but again, that I think is a brilliant way they've implemented that. Um, so, yeah, that's probably something else that I really do enjoy about it. The Watchtower, I love the feature because I like the security challenge that LastPass had. The thing that's my only other annoyance with it. I don't know what perfect is and I want to be perfect. <laughs> oh, the total, and what's I, your, what's your score? I'm sure your score is way above mine. I'm at 10, 10, but I've got 29 sites with inactive two-factor authentication. 1182. Oh, that's not that much better. Interesting. Because yes, I don't know what perfect is. And I, and, but the problem is it says you're all good. Nothing. There's nothing that requires your attention here. And I'm like, it's well, maybe 1182 is perfect. <laughs> maybe it is. You know, you should text him. You should ask him, what is perfect? I need a perfect I, score. There is a long thread of people asking, what is a perfect score? And they answer every question around that, but don't tell us what perfect is. And I, it's like, it's almost like they're like, yeah, just keep trying. But it's like, I don't know what else to try. I've done everything I could. Well, and I mean, so I wonder will, whether if you've got a 16 character password, which is considered fantastic, but if you made it 32, you'd get 1183. That's try, try taking one of your passwords and just making it one digit longer and see what it does. <laughs> I'll have to play around. So that's probably another thing. When you change a password on the site, it always goes to the, I think it's, is it memorable? Not memorable. It's um smart password. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I think it's, and I was, memorable. I think it's, I think it's smart. And what doesn't make sense to me a little bit about smart is I was assuming that smart somehow knew something about the site. There's no smart. There's memorable, random, and pin code. No, well, I thought when you go to change a password on a site, it I'm has doing a, it. Well, a website may ask that. 
but no, no. Are you sure, are you um, sure you're not so, looking at um, you're not using iCloud Keychain? All right, so I am. Let's see. I'm going to jump right in my, my Google account right now. Let's just jump in here. Let's and do this do real now. time. I'll do the play by yeah. play. Yeah. No, because all right. Yeah, this is probably boring to listen to. So no. I recall being on a site, and it when you in the upper right hand corner of your browser when you choose, and it's like, hey, I'm going to generate a password for you. I think there's one like Smart where it tries to build a little bit shorter of a password that is ready for the site. And what I thought it was doing is either scraping the site or knowledge of the site to say, hey, this meets all the password requirements of the site or potentially most common. My concern was there are some sites that like you can have a 65 character password, but I don't, I don't want it to be quote smart and give me something that's only like, you know, 25 characters. Uh, let's go like, give me in the fifties. I'll be happy <laughs> with that. So I just wanted the passwords a little bit longer in some of those areas. So I think that's probably the only uh, challenge or issue or concern that I had with some of the password chains. But well, I guess you can you change play, the number of words. You can make that sucker real long if you tell it 15 yeah. words, throw in separators. I just go with random. By the way, I just discovered something I, I did not. Well, I want it to be typable because there's going to be that time you need to type it. So I, I, I don't actually use the, the password manager, uh, the password suggestion feature in 1Password. I use Bart's xkpasswd.net uh, password generator. Okay. Um, but the thing I've been was going to ask you why one password doesn't and tell you I hate this about it. I just discovered it does have is what I've never been able to get it to do is put numbers in. But I just noticed if you can change the separator to be numbers and symbols. So I just had separators as you know hyphen spaces periods commas underscores, but I didn't notice you could make it uh, numbers and symbols. So you can end up with a a nice messy long uh, password with stuff you can't possibly type. Yeah, I have not played around with, uh, let's see, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, I haven't played around with that. So I, I just told it three words. The... I just told it three words, numbers and symbols, capitalize and full words. So it says fell in all caps, the number four, sightly, exclamation point, arch on, which apparently is a word. <laughs> so is there is there a reason why you prefer the, uh, I'll call it the, uh, not memorable, but the, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's they call the memorable, memorable passwords. Because Is there a reason why you like memorable? Yeah, because it's a lot easier to type when you do need to type it. Is okay, I can yeah. look at it and I can go, okay, fell slightly arch on. All right, I got a four and an exclamation point in between. Without looking at it, I can repeat that back to you. But if gotcha. it's if it's L7QO0, you know, I haven't got a chance. I do like, okay, another thing I like about 1Password is that it um, uses syntax highlighting. So if it's a number, it's going to be blue. If it's going to, a special symbol, it's uh, it's orange. Oh, and if it's a letter, it's white. So you can tell when zeros from reveal. O's. Yes, I yeah. love that in reveal. One, well, sorry, what LastPass did that. One password does that. That is a healthy option when you're revealing passwords. I also you can figure out what the characters are. I also like show and large type. That's another one of my favorites. Hmm, I haven't played around with that. If one you yet. if you select instead of hitting copy on a password, if you hit the downward arrow, there's reveal and show in large type. It goes boom so and I, it puts it huge across your screen. I will give a recommendation. So when I was doing a lot of my password changes, what I tend to be so I was tend to be in the browser changing the password, and I would have the desktop app open and I would paste the passwords into the desktop app mm -hmm. because I feel that they're a little too aggressive as to when they pop the dialogue saying, okay, we've recognized a new password. Do you want to save it? It's like, eh, hasn't committed here yet. And it's like, it's overload on the page. So it's like, I have to kind of save it before I can submit it on the site only to find out it fails. And then I have to go through password history. So I, I, I feel that they should wait until you submit. You know, before it's funny. Virtually everybody I talk to feels like that. I know a lot of people who bring up like a text editor and they paste it in there while they finish and then they I, go over and they copy and paste it. I don't, I tend to trust it, uh, uh, but I, yeah, I've gotten burned, but not that often enough to worry yeah. about it, but I know everybody worries about that. So that, that's a pain point they should try to figure out how to get around if that, if so everybody I know does that. Over 400 passwords, I probably had, I had that happen to be probably a dozen times where the the site didn't actually accept the password. All right. But what I had happen far more often to me was I would have, again, the desktop app open. I would generate a password in the browser. I would paste the password in. I'd hit submit. It would accept it. And then I would go to paste it into the, uh, to the desktop app. The problem is 
I, the muscle memory was you got to remember to click edit to edit the record, then to paste the password. And if you click on the password field ready to type, you've literally just copied the password over top of what you had. It's like, oh my gosh, what have I done? So you don't use a uh, clipboard manager? Well, it wasn't. No, I Actually, don't. a lot of clipboard so, managers won't, won't take password fields. So the nice thing with one password, which I found out of in the, my first moment of panic, like I just changed this password on a site and I don't know the, the password was um, that you can, I think it's the dot, dot, dot in the cup in the upper corner, I think it is, which gets you out and you can actually look at your password history. So that I will say I burned myself a couple times where I didn't know password was, history was there for a long time either. Yeah, maybe some of these uh, things from a UI perspective should be more revealed. We've yes. got a list of two things: password history and QR codes scanning. Yeah, and just for anybody who hasn't run into it, it's actually if you um if you click on like in your browser extension, if you click on the last pass browser extension at the very top, you have the search box. Right to the right of it, there's like a little thing that looks like a hamburger menu, which is a menu. If you tap on that, there's a thing for password generator, and then. On that list, there's an option to get to password generator history at the very bottom. When you click on that, it shows you all the sites and all the most the re most recent one is right at the top. So you're never far off from it. But just remember that's how you get to it. Because when you burn yourself and you're like you're at that panic moment, they've got you covered. Your password is actually stored Same. in that password history. You can get to it. So, so again, um, I don't actually ever use the uh, the little button in the uh, URL bar. Oh, I don't tend to use that. I tend to just use command backslash and it, it pops it in or I open up the web. I open up the, the, uh, desktop app. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, so, so else? let's see if from a, from a top level picture now, um, Oh, I know the other thing I wanted to ask you was when I originally used LastPass and then I moved over to one password, one of my biggest surprises was looking back at LastPass, how, Linuxy and open sourcey it felt, you know, versus a polished UI in terms of graphics and things like that. And I just assumed that they had come a long ways. And then, but Lindsay said the first thing Lindsay said was, "Oh my gosh, one password is beautiful." She just really liked that. Like when you have a login for a website, it grabs the icon for the website, so it's easier to see in a list. This is going to be Amazon, or this is going to be California Pizza Kitchen. And uh, she was really surprised and delighted by the, the UI itself. Do you feel that or doesn't matter to you because you're a nerd? Oh, no, no. It's, it's, I, I feel like I've gone from yeah, running a Linux product to running uh, a Mac OS product. It's, it, it's a beautiful product. They've, they've definitely gone well above and beyond what I need from a user experience in a product. It is fantastic. From mm -hmm. a UI standpoint, they've done a really good job there. Once you get over, and again, when you're coming from something that you really did like, because I really loved LastPass mm -hmm. as a, what it provided for me, you're trying to figure out like, how do I do this like I did in LastPass? And some of those things I'm trying to relinquish, equivalent domains is one I'll hold on to for a while, but <laughs> I, am, I am trying to step away and look at it from, all right, what's the proper way of LastPass to do that? Like migration is, one I think one of the things that, thank you, one password. Migration is one of those things that I'm, I've been tripped, I got tripped up on. Like you and I were going back and forth about how to migrate last night. Yeah, describe I, I describe this problem um, because unfortunately I changed to a, a, a family plan long enough ago that I don't remember the process. I remember there being a stumbling step, but it doesn't sound like what you've run into. So so Karen was an existing LastPass, uh, one password yes. user. You Correct. created a new vault and a family plan. Yes. And then you're so trying was, to migrate her in. Right, which I think probably was my first mistake. I should have made her the family plan. And I migrated into where she was at. Just so because she just of where became, you came from. But, but yeah, if, you I was, both had one password, if you both had one password account, you would have run into this. So what was the problem you ran into? So when I was trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I invite her to the family plan? And I, okay, there's the invite place. Let me just send invites out to everybody. So when we invited her, what it's, I think it's probably part of what my expectations were from the product. So what I had expected to happen was I clicked invite. I sent, I put in her email address, which is her current, you know, email address she uses for, um, for one password. And it would just be like a, do you want to join this family plan? And voila, she's there. And there was literally nothing more for her to do. That's just not how it works. Um, and then when 
she accepted the invite. I was like, why are you creating a username and password? This makes no sense. I was like, okay, I've done something wrong here. We'll stop. And at, even though she can go through the process, I have to accept her into the family plan before I think the whole process stops. So I was like, let's mm-hmm. stop right here. We actually haven't progressed any further. You and I chatted last night, but uh, yeah, we need I to never... do a screen share com- where I get to see what's going on. Yeah, of course we do. Or I need to, uh, or because... I need to fly to to uh, Maryland. To, That's to even help. better. We make some barbecue. Uh, <laughs> so hang on. We're American.com. <laughs> Where I got concerned was because we had that issue in the past with her having the six and seven volt. And what I didn't want to run into is she already doesn't like, she uses the password manager because I finally, you know, strong arm strong her password manager, right. but she loves it now. Um, but what I couldn't have happen is that she's running right. into mix mashing of credentials, logging in, and the vault looks empty. Anything and, that makes it harder. And, yeah. And when in reading the, I, I sent you a link. We should probably include the link to the uh, article that I found, which the one person said. I, not an article. It was a, it was a discussion forum. forum, but we think the way it was written, it was the person who, um, it, it was somebody who worked there at one point. Yeah. It smells like Yeah. That. So. It started in 2018, but most of the thread was in 2018. So if you stumble across yeah. it, I'm like, well, surely in the last four years, they've changed this process because people are describing, well, you can have two accounts with LastPass, one that is like an enterprise, one that is a personal, or one that is a personal, one that is a family with the same email address. And I'm like, what? It makes no sense. Like, So how do I know which one I'm logging into? And that's where I was like, all right, I'm hugely concerned that I could get something messed up with my wife. I'm like, this has probably changed over four years. So let me find the right thread. Because if I go down the pathway of this and I'm 100% wrong, I create a bad experience for the wife and the migration. And then I get flamed for, why'd you use it, rely on a four-year-old article? Yeah. So I was looking for the newer article that explained it. But apparently the process is, just create your new account, copy your data over, and then de- delete your old account and away you go. Which again, it's simple. But I was expecting it to be invite them to the the new organization, new family, Suck it and it just essentially as long as they're logged in, it'll say, okay, we're just going to move your you're moved over to the new family. We're going to decommission your old account, and it just becomes like a seamless process for the user. And it, I know there's a security reason in the background behind it, but I would have expected it to be a bit more seamless for right. the user to transition from personal into family without so saying I'd- open up two vaults and copy. In the discussion forum, the, the the person answering the question said, "If if it worked that way, where you just invite somebody and it sucks them in, they said you wouldn't be able to share vaults, which is huge if they did it that way, and you wouldn't be able to do recovery for other family members." Now, I don't understand why that's true with the way the architecture is done, um, but I absolutely do not remember making a second account. I remember our shared vault; we had to mess with it. We had to create a new shared vault and move everything into that. But that's yeah. the only thing I can remember uh, having to do. Yeah. And here's the thing. If, let's say, for example, they're saying, well, your vault is tied to your encryption key. So you have to gen- we have to generate all new encryption. Totally fine. Mm-hmm. But when I say to join the family pen, it says, okay, log into your vault. You'll see a pop-up that says you're joining the family. And it just says, please wait while we re-encrypt your vault into the family plan. You have your own private vault. That it, they literally could do all this behind the scenes. And it was just something that I'm like... Okay, this cannot be like I understand this. Maybe this I thought maybe this is when they just added family plans and they just said, let's get it out the door. It's not the prettiest process, mm-hmm. but we'll deal with it over the next couple releases. Mm-hmm. So I figured there has to be another article. So what I have been doing is scouring and trying to find it. And when we did the show, I'm like, this is what's frustrating me is that I thought I almost screwed up my wife's fault trying to add her to this family plan versus anything else. So apparently that is the process. So I'll just copy paste and be logged into two volts. Yeah. And and by the way, it's not copy paste. It's command a to select all (laughs) right, click, move to select the fault and you're done. Yes. I mean, the way you're saying it sounds like copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy. Cause somebody the person in the forum said that they were doing that and they're like, no, you don't have to do that. And I think four years ago, they didn't have the move thing. And by the way, you can drag and drop too, which was a new feature added just recently. I well, have not done drag and drop, but I have done, uh, I think the thing that was, I felt like they didn't have multi-select when I first was messing around, but yeah, just multi-select yeah. and- Command A. You, away you go. Command A. Command A. Select all. Well, <laughs> it's mainly, it's usually like sometimes you want to select a region of credentials sure. and deal with them. Oh, so shift so. select. Yeah. Yeah. That does yeah. work. So overall, 
this is this is what Rod sounds like when he's happy and loves something. <laughs> I like it. It's a really good product. And I know it's funny because you're like, I, I, I almost didn't tell- have him on. He was so mad on SMR. <laughs> I was so frustrated because I was like, I, I literally could have messed up my wife's fault and I will never hear the end. But I'm, I'm not lying I when that. I say I, I don't love the idea of MFA being on the, the record that's in the vault for the like individual uh, cr- save credential, if you will. However, in the shared model, it is golden. Yeah. Like, I don't, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. cannot underscore how nice it is to like, if you have something like where everybody u- uses the same account for ring or nest mm-hmm. and you turn on MFA and you just share it in the vault and like everybody has the code, anybody, yep. oh, your entire family can use the one credential, get into your ring account and they, everybody can do everything they need to do. That is, it's the one brilliant idea where it solidified to me why there are certain accounts you want MFA on. So I'll tell you wh- and, why. In the vault. I tell you why I like it in the vault is I hear people all the time talking about migrating to a new phone and not being able to bring their (laughs) their MFA with them because they had it in a separate authenticator app. That is literally never a problem with 1Password because it just comes with you. I don't know any, I don't know why you would want to use a separate MFA uh, tool except for the separation of security. Yeah. Which not to discount it. Yeah, there is that, the separation. Um, I use I use Google Authenticator. I use Microsoft. Uh, Oof, so I use both all over of those. The place? I do use a couple, but I use very ones for different reasons. But I will say, with some of them, I really do like the the push. I mean, and again, what the what push. we're doing in One Password is very seamless because you don't the dialogue pops, it fills, and it goes, and you don't think about it anymore, which is nice. Um, but with push, you just get a notification on your phone, and you can complete the. I don't login. know what push is. I don't know what you mean. Ah. Uh, so um, a long time ago, a company called Duo implemented this concept that most people really love called push, which is you go to log in and rather than saying, hey, go get your RSA token ID and type in the six digit code on it, it would just push to your uh, authenticator app on your phone saying, do you approve the sign in for on this IP address, this user, da, da. like you just try to sign into Microsoft, are you approving it? And you say approve. And then you do your fingerprint authentication or face ID, and it would complete. Then on your computer, the login process would complete. So push allowed that when with. I I think this is kind of the way my uh, one of my investment companies works. Is when I go to log in on my desktop, it sends a push notification to my phone, and it looks at my face ID and says, "Yes, I want to. I want to let that in." Way harder than just having it enter the code and move on. Way harder. Yes, when it magically enters a code, it is definitely harder. There's some that no, you, no, like, magically enters a code is easier. Oh you know, no, yeah, sorry, magically yeah. enters the code is super easy. Mm-hmm. But push is, I'd say, it's pretty daggone easy because you just tap and you're logged in. And again, no, it's remember, like five taps. It's push. yes, I want to send something to my phone. Which phone would you like to send it to? This phone. Pick up my 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 phone. Let it see my face ID so that I'm going to get the push notification. The push notification comes up. I have to tap on it. It then comes up and says, okay, <laughs> do you want to allow this? I tap it again. I say, yes. Now it does my face ID another time because now it's the app asking for face ID. And then it goes uh, back to the to the website. So it's like, so it's easy, your bank, but it's Your long. bank was a worse experience. So for me, my Android phone, yes, I do have to get into the phone. Uh-huh. But I would, you pull down your notifications, you'd see like, you know, sign in here and I click approve. And then immediately it just, it sees my face again. And it's like, it's so it is doing your face right. twice yes, where I've already is. told the website, I've already d- authenticated to the website. Well, it's authenticating you to the authenticator app saying, uh, and it's like your secure, it would be equivalent to accessing the secure, secure enclave on your iPhone to saying I'm getting into another security area. So yeah. I'm revalidating yeah. that the holder of the phone is who I think they are. So I'm going to do a really quick face ID check before I allow this login process to complete. Like, so for my, the, my work, I cannot complete the process with an authenticator app unless I log into it. Other authenticator apps, like the application provider may say, I don't require additional authentication. So yeah. the app I think might you'd pop like, up and just say- You'd like it to ask it. for your authentication. I don't think that's a bad thing. Absolutely. But yeah, I would yeah, rather absolutely. not have this separate device problem. That that doesn't sound as fun to me. Yeah, security isn't easy. Yeah. It's it, nice. There's a separation that is nice. Um, yeah, but if, I like as a convenience of putting them in all in one place, I do. I will say I enjoy, but I I do have it 
on my less concerning items. I don't have it on my banks. Okay. So um, one last thing I want to uh, give you a hard time for on uh, la- on uh, the SMR podcast, you eventually figured it out. You cracked the code during the show. But one of your big complaints was, why does it log me out all, one password log me out all the time? It does uh, it so quickly. That was and you didn't, me mad. But you didn't go as far as to look in settings to see if there was an option to change it. And it was like at 45 minutes into the show where Chris kind of goes, well, did you look in settings? And you said, well, let me look right now. And you go, oh, there it is. <laughs> so here's the but funny you, thing. You had ranted for like seven minutes on this topic without looking. So this is this tells you sometimes uh, we all are glutton for punishment. So I'll give you a story with uh with work. So on my work, when I log in, I have to use MFA, multi-factor authentication, and the default is to put in the code. So I would get I would have to open up the app, get the codes, type them in. I was like, oh, this sucks. And I was like, I just and I know all I need to do is go into three sixty five. And switch the default method from code to app. Literally, I just change one drop down and say, use the authenticator app. It will then push to the phone and I just click approve and I'm done. So I've literally removed all friction. I know this. I've done it at multiple organizations. It took a year before it annoyed (laughs) me enough to change it. So this was one of those things where it would log me off and I was like, "Ah," but I need to get back in. So I get back in and everything's great. I'm right in the middle of it. Yeah. And yeah. then, but mind you, I've only been a one password user for like a month. So it's, it's been scratching at me. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, when we were talking about things that annoy me. I was like, oh, let me talk about this thing. This annoys me because I hadn't looked into it. Cause it was like, it's just annoying me, but it's, it's that, it's that like little brother who just keeps like scratching your arm saying, this yeah, is yeah, probably yeah. you yet. It's going to get you. Um, <laughs> that was one of those things. So I've already changed that setting. And, Okay, so so there's two different settings we're talking about here. I want to make sure we're clear because I have a second question related to this. One is auto lock, and it's set by default. It's lock on sleep, screensaver, switching users. But then there's lock after the computer is idle for, and I think yours was set to like two minutes, and you can have it, it anywhere was, from one minute to never, uh, yes. it, and uh, you can have it eight hours. I think having it check out after like thirty minutes is pretty pretty good. Um, but there's a second thing was you kept saying, I kept having to type my password so you can have it unlocked with touch ID or your Apple watch, but you're not an Apple user anymore uh, on on your phone, but you do have a Mac, but you're probably talking about on your PC. No, I'm talking about on my Mac. So here's the thing. If in yours, you use, you have one monitor, but do you, you have your Mac up and open at all times, right? Like it's like your second and, monitor or no? Yes, and I have a keyboard with my with my Touch ID on it. I should just go get a keyboard with Touch ID. Yeah. So your problem so, is you're using your Mac in clamshell mode. I'm old school. Ooh, he's got an extended uh, keyboard. Extended keyboard. Okay. I've had this for I couldn't even tell you how long, and it's it doesn't keyboard. have Touch ID on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a fantastic keyboard. So I haven't. I don't. And yes, mine is in clamshell mode, so it's closed all the time, and it's under my desk. So I if I want to solve the problem, I have to go into there, open it up, and then screen resolutions all God, go out of yeah. whack while you open it, tap it, and then close it. So it's easier just to put the password in. Screen resolution. I will say the one thing it did help whack, me do okay. is it helped me rememorize my uh, one password. My password from putting yeah, it in. Yeah, that's actually so a good idea. Fun. Yeah, that isn't the worst idea. But uh, yeah, if you get one of the, uh, I don't know if they make the extended keyboard with Touch ID. They do the uh, the little one. I, 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 so I do type in numbers a lot. I'm yeah, yeah, no, a lot. no, I understand so. that. I. It just takes up too much desk space. Why do you have it in clamshell mode? A lot of people do, and I know Bart does now, and I don't get it. Why not have more screen real estate on your desk? You just don't have room. I, have a, I literally have a 49-inch monitor in front of me. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We did talk about the giant <laughs> monitor. I think I had Chris yeah. on to talk about the giant monitor that you bought as well. It, it's massive, so I don't I don't need any more screen real estate. Right. And it's very funny because it'd be funny to go from 49 inches down to like a 13-inch uh, uh, computer screen. So. It's just easy but it's to just have the ones. I have 32 this, and, and uh, 14, so I, I like that. So I, as I said, like sometimes I let things bother me. Uh, there are some things that I don't let bother me. And one of them is if I have two, I usually run, I used to run dual monitors all the time. If one monitor failed and it was not produced and I couldn't buy anymore, I threw them both away and bought two new monitors. I, I cannot have two non-matching monitors where it's slightly off. They can't get them perfectly aligned. Like when I had two monitors or three. Yeah. Yeah. They literally have to be butt side to side. They have to look the same. If they look different, if I'm dealing, yeah, color hues, all that stuff, they got to both go. I got to get two new ones to start off with. It's, it's a workflow thing, but if you're on your computer enough, I I see people who have like a 25 inch monitor, a 
13 inch monitor next to it. I'm like, I don't know how you do that. Cause even dragging windows, yeah. it's like, Oh, I'm too high. I need to drag lower. Cause the size, I, Nope, not doing it. I've been there, suffered through that. And I said, never again. All right. I just spent 200 bucks of your money. You can get, you can get the extend keyboard with the uh, touch ID. All right. Ooh, Comes in white or black. black. The black yeah, one. Yeah. I like these black keys. This yeah. might be a, this might be a buy. All right. There you go. <laughs> Before I spend any more money with you, this and you need yeah, to go so, back to the iPhone so you can wear an Apple Watch. And because I, I got all excited because I got the Touch ID keyboard, and I thought, you know, I was having to reach all the way over to the right here to touch my my keyboard on my Mac. So I was all excited about getting this, but the stupid watch gets precedence. So the watch is, is always going. I'm ready before I can even get my finger down there. So yeah, I should. Uh, yeah, I. There are things I do miss about the iPhone, but I will say the camera on these Samsung phones are just crazy good. So nice. God, and the screen is unbelievable. Well, that's um, a discussion for another day about why you went to the dark side. <laughs> the thing I find so fascinating about you, and, and I admire it because it's something I don't have in my DNA at all, is that you can just abandon things. I, I yeah. couldn't abandon the Apple ecosystem if, I mean, I'd probably sell one of my kids, you know, one, the good one I'd keep. But, uh, you know, I, I, before I could leave Apple, before, I mean, leaving one password would be, that'd be heart wrenching for me to have to do that. Uh, but you're just like, ah, I'm not going to use Apple anymore because it made me mad, even though it was 100% my fault and uh, or my son's fault. And then, uh, and you just go, I'm, I'm on Android now. And I don't yes. know how you do that. I, that's amazing to me. I would, I would honestly, if, if someone would sponsor it, I would love to have you go on a challenge, like a, like a 30, 90 day challenge of you have to only use windows and Android, uh, Android phones. Like you like literally you have to turn off everything. Apple, like Apple TV gone. Like you oh. got to figure out your life for the next 30 days without anything. Apple in your life. No <laughs> Apple watch, no this, no that just 30 days and like, see if you could go. Oh, yeah. actually, thirty would probably be enough. I guess <laughs> I think you'd have the shakes after about two weeks. Oh, so. I, I'd have shakes within the day. I, I did briefly use Windows at work for about three years, and you could constantly hear out of my office me screaming, "People choose this!" because it was so uh -huh. bad. I hated every minute. Now, to be fair, it was Windows Vista was the only oh, yeah, uh, was Windows I ever year. used, but it was it was it was a nightmare. I I couldn't stand it. Yeah, but I will like again. My day to day runner is a Mac, and mm -hmm. I struggle like when it's like, or I have to do like any creative workflow. Um, I can't, I can't do those on Windows anymore. It's like, no, nope, I need to use a uh, ScreenFlow. Like if I'm recording, I want to record in ScreenFlow. I want to edit it in Final Cut. I can use Adobe Premiere, but I don't like it as much as I like Final Cut for my editing. Is Premiere, yeah, Premiere. Um, so there's a lot of flows that I really do like significantly better on the Mac, but. Um, yeah, switching technologies. I think it's it's healthy because you find what you like. It, it on is each side of the aisle a little it. more. I couldn't do it. I'm a loyalty. I mean, I've been going to the same hairdresser for like 35 years, and I don't even like like her or the way she cuts my hair. <laughs> but I've always been doing Habit. it, so I'm going to keep doing it forever. <laughs> yeah, I've I found what's shocking for me. Uh, I use um, virtual desktops, Spaces. I, I, yeah, it's called Spaces. Yeah, on Windows they have virtual desktops. Mm -hmm. literally if you talk to windows users 90 percent of them never use it i don't never know what's, use a, it. what's a virtual desktop you know on the mac if you take three fingers and swipe on your mouse you are on like a new oh spaces screen. sure spaces yeah yeah windows i think okay yes windows calls them virtual desktops max calls them spaces okay you happily use them and frequently use them i i love them uh, I, I, I literally cannot change my workflow. When I get on Windows, I have to remember uh, it's control arrow to switch between spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I talk to most Windows users, they're like, what the heck are you? Like, they don't even understand what it is. And then you start explaining this feature that Microsoft had, how great it is. But people are like, I, but you can't see it. I'm like, exactly. Like, you <laughs> can take your email, throw it onto another screen. And when you want to be in email mode, you just go to the screen with email. And when I launch email, I can tell it to launch always in the space so that if I have to close it because it's consumer memory or something crazy and I launch it, it just launches back in the space I want it. I can handle that whole quote screen for my workflow. And if I need to be in browser doing research, if I need to be in, in chatting, I can be over there, but I can be truly singular focus. And so, uh, a lot you, of Windows users don't use it. You'd enjoy this. Uh, on uh, the Nocilicast, I had my buddy Ron come on with me to talk about how much we really enjoy... Um, uh, stage manager. 
and how neither of us could ever get the hang of spaces. And it just didn't work for us. It just, for w whatever reason, that just didn't work for us and how we really like using Stage Manager. Bart just came on last week where he did a long thing on acknowledging that for you guys, that makes perfect sense the way you think. Here's how I think and why spaces is amazing. And so he, we have both sides of the story of what works for different people. But the important thing that you're trying to point out is we know about both of them. We know they exist. Now, we are power users, so I don't know whether normal people even know that spaces exist. That'd be an interesting question to ask if uh, we, can, we can ask the muggles. But hey, I told you uh, I had 40 minutes to talk. I was mostly worried we might go too short. I should not have worried. It's been an hour and 20 minutes. So I'm actually going to cut us off. No, it's been too long since we chatted. That's the problem. But uh, if people want to follow you online, the best place to go is? Uh, if you want to get me on Twitter, it's Rod Simmons on Twitter. So super simple to find me. But uh, head over to SMR Podcast. Take a listen to the show. We have a lot of fun geeking out. And if you love food, uh, barbecue and tech, bbqandtech.com. BBQ. And you can listen to what we do about barbecue. And tech. So. SMR. That's so quaint. You're still on Twitter, huh? I'm still on Twitter. I haven't left yet. Oh, Mastodon's not so much more fun. <laughs> all right. I'm going to have to go look at this because you said you were on it all this morning. So I, de I definitely need to take a peek at this. All right. Well, I'll let you go now. Thanks a lot, Rod. This was really fun. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chit Chat Across the Pond. Did you notice there weren't any ads in the show? That's because this show is not ad supported. It's supported by you. If you learned something, or maybe you were just entertained, consider contributing to the Podfeet podcast. You can do that by going over to podfeet.com and look for the big red button that says support the show. When you click that button, you're going to find different ways to contribute. If you like to do a one-time donation, you can click the PayPal button. If you want to make a recurring contribution, click the weekly Patreon button. Or another way to contribute is to record a listener contribution. It's a great way to help the No Silla Castaways learn from you. If you want to contact me for any reason, you can email me at allison at podfeet.com and you can follow me on Twitter at podfeet. Maybe you want to talk to other No Silla Castaways. You can do that in our Slack group at podfeet.com slash Slack. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.